The world is changing up in space very much. Uh, we've had the International Space Station flying now for the, over two decades. Um, but we've got a Chinese space station up there now. We are having uh, the first of the commercial flights of private paying passengers going to uh, spacecraft that are going to the ISS, that are staying on the ISS, that aren't going to the ISS. Um, really, the world is changing very much. Um, and we're discussing the future of what's going to happen to the International Space Station um, with its partners. And what will the commercial platforms that succeed it look like? All of this is happening while thousands of new satellites are being launched into low Earth orbit, which is complicating the space picture greatly. The panel uh, now for the next hour or so, we're going to identify gaps in regulatory and legal regimes that currently exist to govern space stations. And we're going to look at how best uh, we might ensure the next stage of human spaceflight in low Earth orbit is done in a sustainable and cooperative manner. My name is Libby Jackson. I work at the UK Space Agency, where I am the Exploration Science Manager. I've been working in the field of human spaceflight for the best part of two decades. Uh, within my uh, portfolio at the Space Agency, I look after the science that we do on the space station and uh, the humans who go there, the astronauts. Uh, prior to my time at the UK Space Agency, I spent seven years working uh, in mission control for the ISS. So I have seen uh, up close, uh, really, the amazing science that we do on the space station, uh, the people who make it happen, both in space and on the ground, and the real dangers that are posed by space debris every day um, with the humans living inside tin cans, which are pretty thinly um, thin on the outside. There's, there's not much separating uh, the crew inside from uh, the harsh environment outside. To uh, take us through this, uh, I am absolutely thrilled that we've got a wonderful panel. Uh, Rebecca Bresnik from uh, the Chief Assistant Counsel for International Matters at uh, NASA, but also uh, at, I'm going to let her introduce herself better. <laughs> Um, good Rebecca. afternoon. My name is Rebecca Bresnik, and I'm um, an adjunct professor at the University of Houston, where I teach space law. Um, in addition to that, I've um, also been counsel to NASA for two decades, and the majority of that being primary counsel to the International Space Station. Thank you. And then Lucy Edge, the Chief Operating Officer at the Satellite Applications Catapult. Yeah, well, not much more to add to that, to be honest, but at the Catapult, we do work very closely with, with industry, government, and academia to try and overcome some of these more difficult problems, so I think it will be a good conversation today. Thank you. And then on my left, uh, I'm delighted to welcome Tanya masson Span, the Assistant Professor of Law at Leiden University. I am. Yes. yes, I'm an Assistant Professor of Space Law and Deputy Director of the International Institute of Air and Space Law that was founded at Leiden University uh, in 1985. And uh, I also advise the Dutch government on implementation of our legislation. Uh, we don't have human spaceflight yet, but it is certainly one of the topics that I have been doing, addressing in my research, uh, both orbital, suborbital. So looking forward to the debate. Thank you very much. And then finally, uh, at the end, and definitely not last but not least, uh, Eric uh, Stalmer from Voyager Space Holdings. Yes, I am Eric Stalmer from uh, Voyager Space Holdings. So we all check out. We all say who we are. Um, <laughs> uh, I've been with Voyager for about two and a half years now. And prior to that, I, uh, I ran the Commercial Space Flight Federation, which was an organization of about 85 to 90 different commercial space uh, companies and organizations. So I got a pretty good mix and overview and insight into the uh, commercial space industry and, and how it's grown over the last 10 years. So uh, I'm thrilled to be on this panel and thank uh, Secure World for, for putting together such a, an all-star list here yeah. and myself. <laughs> I, think, I think you will agree we've got all the right people to, to tackle this subject. Uh, we're going to be starting with some questions uh, that we've got already, but this is, of course, an interactive session. Uh, so in your Hoover app, please do uh, start asking questions. I will see them here on my uh, technology, and we'll be able to relay them to the panel. So uh, please do get involved uh, and ask away. Um, but we're going to start. Um, Tanya, if it's okay, question for you. Um, can you set the scene for us. What is the current legal international regime that relates uh, to human spaceflight in low Earth orbit? 
Yeah, that's an interesting question. I can, I'll, I'll spend just a few minutes to, uh, to outline that. Of course, we, uh, I, I always like to underline that there is a basic legal framework. We've heard several references to space law in this, uh, in this exciting symposium, and uh, sometimes people say, oh, it's outdated, it's old, it doesn't address everything. Uh, that's perhaps true. It needs, uh, it needs additions, it needs uh, to be complemented. But there is a set of, uh, of rules and principles that apply to uh, activities activities in outer space, and that uh, uh, is law made by the United Nations, by the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. We have a set of five treaties and uh, resolutions on, on principles and so on, uh, which do set certain rules also regarding, uh, that, that, that apply also to human space flight. And so for instance, the responsibility of states for national activities in outer space, liability of launching states for damage caused either in outer space or on the Earth. Uh, and, and specific um, uh, rules set uh, then complemented in the, uh, in the um, liability convention that subsequently was adopted after the Outer Space Treaty. Um, we also have rules that say that uh, astronauts are envoys of mankind in the Outer Space Treaty. Of course, you can wonder what that means, and especially in the new context uh, of, of private astronauts, what, what is the meaning? Are they a kind of ambassador? Uh, do they get special protection? Is there a difference with, uh, with private astronauts? Should there be? Um, also principles of due regard for each other's activities, and that's of course very important in the sense of linking this topic to the sustainability subject for which we are uh, gathered here these days, and, uh, and, and the principle of non-harmful interference with each other's activities, which if that is happening or there is a risk of that happening, states can request consultation with each other. So um, uh, obviously that is a set of quite general principles, uh, and we have had since the 1960s when these rules were adopted, human spaceflight has become reality. We have had 60 years plus of uh, human spaceflight with, of course, Yuri Gagarin being the first human and Valentina Tereskova, I always like to mention the first woman in space as well. Uh, and several space stations that have, uh, have been uh, launched into outer space, uh, but, but two of them are uh, special, well three now I guess, Mir, uh, the Russian space station that was assembled in outer space and uh, was deorbited in 2001, and then sub uh, subsequently the International Space Station, um, which uh, first had an, uh, an agreement, a set of rules, very interesting legal framework with an intergovernmental agreement followed up by memoranda of understanding between agencies and then implementing agreements with all the other uh, actors that are involved, which was adopted first in 1988 and then, uh, and of course I'm sure Rebecca will say more about that, but then uh, another IGA was adopted in 1998 when uh, Mir was uh, ending and Russia, Russian Federation joined uh, the ISS. So we have already that set of uh, additional rules in the uh, space station framework that uh, address certain aspects that were not addressed in those treaties because obviously uh, the founding fathers, mothers of the treaties did not know everything that would be happening. So there you have rules on intellectual property rights or on criminal jurisdiction or on the cross waiver of liability among the partners so that they could work together and not be boiled down in, in legal disputes on, uh, on liability issues. Um, and that is, I think, a very uh, solid framework. The question, of course, is going to be, is that also going to be suitable for the next step? And uh, discussions are now ongoing for uh, the Gateway Program, where the 15 states that have been involved with ISS, except Russia, so actually 14, um, are in agreement of using the legal framework of the ISS to also work on the gateway, which is of course not uh, a, a quite interesting legal um, uh, finding because the ISS agreement was made for building a station in low Earth orbit. Uh, the gateway is obviously not in low Earth orbit, but uh, the IGA contains an article on evolution of the station, and so the partners agreed that um, they could interpret the gateway as an evolution of the station as a next step. So that would mean there is no need for having a whole new legal framework, but they could uh, put that uh, cooperation under the 
uh, under the IGA framework. Of course, it's interesting because there's one partner missing, so what does that mean that may have some legal implications? And now we have the this, this step towards private stations, and I'm sure we'll be discussing that more, uh, so I won't go into that now, but that will raise a whole lot of other questions on the legal status of private astronauts, um, liability issues, and what have you. But perhaps I'll leave it to that for now. All right, thank you, Tanya. But I think that's a great uh, transition into the question I wanted to ask to Rebecca next. Tanya mentioned a lot about the evolution that we've got to the gateway uh, and so on, but we're seeing all these commercial players come in low Earth orbit. Um, thinking about the commercial stations, what are we going to need to do? Are there going to be modif modifications or additions to all the regulations that were set up for the ISS? How do we handle these new commercial space stations? So um, before I start, yes. every good attorney has to say that I'm not speaking for my agency. I'm speaking for myself and my personal capacity. Um, but yes, um, so as we were doing that, that uh, those negotiations from ISS to Gateway, um, we, we took a look at what was going on on ISS and what worked and how to take that to Gateway, what to take to Gateway. It wasn't a one for one. We didn't take the whole legal structure with us. And I think that's very true of also these, these private space stations. Um, one really important thing to note is we actually do not have a lot of regulations regulating the, the International Space Station. It's a, a governmental activity, um, very similar to space launches that are done by the government. We do not fall under the commercial regulations that commercial entities would, would fall under. Um, we are transitioning a bit with regards to that. Um, as you are seeing, we are purchasing services now from commercial entities, and those activities now are being commercially licensed. But for ISS activities, the only activities that are actually regulated are um, primarily the crew code of conduct and the liability framework. And that was actually just to be able to implement what our requirements were in the intergovernmental agreement that, that Tanya had mentioned. So it's, it's very interesting because we do have 20 years of experience of, hey, what has worked the past two, two decades and what hasn't. And we do hope that these commercial entities will look and many of, when, when you look at the people that are within these commercial entities too, many of them come from NASA, they come from the government, so they have this experience. Um, as you saw most recently, you saw Axiom 1, the Axiom 1 mission, and Axiom is also looking at building a, a structure in outer space as well. Well, the, um, the CEO of Axiom was also the International Space Station Program Manager for, for 10 years. So there's a lot of that knowledge going into the private sector just via the people. Um, but how else is that knowledge getting passed on and to make sure that um, there are some sort of rules or regulations, and I don't like using the word regulations. I like, uh, I, well, I think there should be some regulating going on. It's a small R, not a big R. Um, very similar to um, commercial space flight. We are not regulating commercial space flight. We are, um, it, there's a moratorium right now. While there are basic rules on, on the managing of space flight, we are trying not to regulate and allow the commercial, allow commercial entities to develop the commercial space without being overly regulated. Um, I think that is a, a similar concept of what we will be seeing also for these commercial international space stations. However, as I said, I hope that they look to what we have, what we've learned in the past two decades. And um, some of those things would be you know, what are, the, what are the medical standards for, for crew on going up to a commercial space station? Um, that to me would be information and standards that you would wanna use whether you're on a commercial platform or a government platform. Um, there's a, a lot of practicality to that. You wanna make sure that obviously your crew are, are healthy. And, and that will also depend upon how long they're up there and what activities they're doing. But in addition to that also, what are the quarantine requirements before you go up to an international space station? And 
you, whether you're a commercial or government, you don't want to get up there, have a sick crew, and remember, if a whole crew goes up and one crew member gets sick, that whole crew has to come back home. That's not good for commercial business. Um, um, some of the other things um, we will have to take a look at is liability. What's the liability structure going to be up there? Currently, we have a cross waiver in place. That's worked great. We ha we've agreed amongst the governments that, that are up there right now working on ISS. Is that the right structure for a commercial space station? What about jurisdiction? So as um, Tanya mentioned, the Outer Space Treaty will obviously apply to these structures. Well, in the Outer Space Treaty, it states that jurisdiction is based on, on who registers that object before it goes up into space. So most likely it would be a, a US company registering these space, these space modules before they go up. So these people will be under US jurisdiction. Does everybody want to be under US jurisdiction? Um, these platforms are going to be meant for internationals, not just domestic persons. What about criminal jurisdiction? Who's going to have jurisdiction over these astronauts if it's not a good day up on these platforms? Um, intellectual property. So the intellectual property rights and the clause that we have in the, in the IGA is it's it's very limited, it's very small, but it's also based on the fact that you have governments cooperating. It's gonna be a very different environment up with these commercial, these commercial platforms where these commercial entities are going to want to keep their intellectual property. They're not going to want to do as much sharing. They're not going to want to give any type of necessarily government use rights to the, to the intellectual property. So what, are, what is going to be the intellectual property structure? And then that's also going to be based on, again, jurisdiction. Um, so there's a lot of things, like I said, that we've learned with ISS, what's applicable to a government platform, but it's not a one-for-one one when you're looking at these commercial platforms, and I think that's, that's something that these commercial entities are going to have to take a look at. Well, let's ask those commercial entities how they're going to look at it. So turning to Eric, um, uh, you've, uh, in the U.S. alone, there are four industry teams, of course, including yours who are working with NASA to develop these concepts for the space station um, for, and the other activities beyond that program. What are the market interests that are driving the activity and what is the role of safety in supporting that interest? Oh, well, great question and thank you so much. Um, y there are four, four other companies in the US and I, I can't speak to the, the other companies, although I have a, a decent idea of what, what they're looking at. From our perspective, from Voyager's perspective, uh, although this is a, a NASA has initiated this process, we are really looking at it from a global perspective. And, you know, and, and I say that in keeping NASA informed each step of the way uh, on what we're doing, on our activity, on our designs. Um, and as you know, the, the CLD contract is a, it's a public private partnership. So NASA isn't just giving us a, a blank check and say, hey, build a space station. They're giving us seed money, but the, the onus is on us and these other companies to raise these funds. Some of the, you know, one of these companies is you know, self-funded billionaires, and that, that's not a problem for them to raise that kind of money or you know, be allocated that kind of money, however you, you, you look at it. But for us, we're, we're raising that money. So we're looking to international partnerships um, from a lot of non-traditional uh, countries that you know, do not have the robust space um, programs like we see with the ISS partners. But of course, you have to look at it from the perspective, if you're an ISS partner, you're saying, well, what does this mean for us in 2030? If the, if the space station goes away in 2030, what, what are the options available to us? And what we are saying is we are open for business. We are working with, um, of course, NASA as, as a, a partner, um, but also the international space agencies will, will be partners as, with us as well. We've had a lot of uh, bilateral uh, meetings with international partners there. But a lot of your non-traditional countries, as I said, that want to participate in space do not have a space program. But we feel that's part of, you know, and timely, given where we are, this, this space sustainability. I, I think in opening the, the pie, it, you know, that it's not everyone gets a slice of pie. I think you got to make a bigger pie. 
so there, there's more pie for everyone. And, and that, that's a critical aspect for, for Voyager. I think that's for the, the, the sanctity and the, the evolution of our, of our world. Um, we need more people involved because we're looking at it, for, and then th those are the partners, but we're looking at it from the, the, the business and, and social aspects that a, an international space station can bring. And that's looking at, um, from a commercial perspective, how do we, the ag tech, you know, and how do we, how, how do we grow and sustain kind of life and, and that, those sort of resources in space to sustain, you know, more development in, in space. So uh, some of the, the commercial endeavors that we're looking at, uh, we've looked to the, um, uh, the UAE government on a, um, a Star Lab Oasis where, you know, the, the desert is one of the harshest environments to grow, to grow food. And, and, and you see the work that the UAE has done in really converting a, a, a desert to you know a, a garden oasis and uh, as well as a, a business and investment you know, hub, but uh, you know they they really transform what, what they have tremendously. So we're we're partnering them on how you can live and grow things in space and and how to develop that um, for food scarcity, water scarcity, and and how do you adapt to that? So that's an interesting partnership. We see uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, pharmaceutical industry has expressed a lot of uh, interest. Uh, as well as the obvious is tourism, but we don't want it to be seen purely as a tourism platform. But you got to look at what pays the bills, and you got to think creatively. And and I got to tell you, some of the the uh, the offers and the proposals that we've gotten from a tourist uh, perspective, you know, uh, mixed martial arts uh, fighting in space. You know, uh, you got to entertain all options. But you know, uh, but there are going to be a lot of those different avenues and and approaches, you know, business models. To make that that you're not limited by the rules, you know that that in, um, inhibited the, uh, the the international space station. So so there are a lot of opportunities, but but you also talked about safety, and that's something that, as uh, uh, Rebecca said, you, you can draw off the 20 years experience that NASA has provided and NASA has gleaned on on what works, what doesn't work. Um, Neil de, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson yesterday said something about contracts and said contracts are, the, the verbiage in contracts are, is only there because a problem came up and you had to write it down. So uh, looking at that, what are the issues that, that has, has the International Space Station has faced, whether it's crew time or maintenance or you know, just uh, writ large safety issues, uh, looking at that, that uh, vast experience that we've had you know, living and working in space for the last 20 years and building off of that and, and the best practices. So that's, that's some of the vision I see for uh, space stations right now. Thank you, Eric. The, the space stations that, that you will bring and that the opportunities there on the current space station is what's uh, driving the work that Lucy does. Um, the Catapult uh, is looking to accelerate the emergence of new space applications. And so what is the contribution that you see from these um, commercial platforms? Do you see any risks in the transition from the ISS to the commercial platforms for all your work? <clears throat> uh, yeah, I mean, there are definitely risks. There are always risks, and the question is, what's our appetite? Um, I, th I think to start, start with that first point, um, you know, mo moving from the ISS, or, or even if the ISS was to be retained, um, but, but moving to having the availability of commercial platforms as well, I mean, th this is a pattern that we've seen in many different sectors, and I don't think it's particularly different here. Um, Eric talked about that pie getting bigger, um, and, and I think that is a really important point. So the accessibility of uh, the platforms, the pace of access to the platforms, and the democratization of the access to the platforms are, are I think, three really, really important points. We're really at the, at the phase at the moment, you know, the ISS is a really good... Um, little vignette of, of, of where the space sector is in general, where this uh, moving from this very strong institutionalised approach, even if it's across many governments, and, and then trying to slowly move into a more commercial world. And there's all sorts of fantastic experiments that go on on the ISS um, that, that fit into that, but they are very much a sort of boutique offer, if you like. And um, boutique offers are often quite expensive, or if not expensive, quite difficult to access. You've either got to know someone who can get you the ticket, or you know, you've got to have a very specific product that fits into a very specific mold. So um, 
I think being able to grow out that offer um, so it can be more user-led um, is, is, is a really important part of it. I think I'll probably sum all that up into an agility of access to the platforms. Um, and, and, you know, we are getting there, but, um, but, but it's going to be a long journey. And uh, uh, many of the panels yesterday and today have alluded to the, sort of the, the balance between the baggage and the lessons learned from having a historic experiences in space. You know, it is extremely powerful information, evidence, risk reduction, but it can also be baggage. You know, we can stick with a legal starting point which may not be appropriate going forwards or a, you know, an, an approach to um, the risk to come to the second point, mm. which is probably not exactly what we want to be doing when we think about the future of the use of LEO. You know, if we, if we start to think about the commercial platforms as one part, for example, of a manufacturing environment in space where we might have a, um, a, an inhabited section, but you might also have several manufacturing areas as well, recycling areas, all sorts of things going on that are much more automated, don't require human interaction, and would they be in the same place or in a different place? You know, that, that's immediately going to stumble upon some really basic problems in the way that we've talked about the ISS, because there will be items of close approach, which will be deliberately there rather than accidentally there. So we'll, we'll stumble before we even start if, if we try and just uh, sort of edit what we've got. So I think there's a really strong need for us to think about what point do we want to get to? What point do users want to get to? And how do we run a risk assessment alongside that that, that, is, that is for the users in the longer term? And when I, when I say that, I mean non-space people, right? You know, we've got, again today, I think we've got quite a heavy space leaning um, at this event, and that's great because it brings all the experience, but the pharma companies or the fiber optics companies or the new materials manufacturers, I, I mean, I don't know what their um, cycle of requirement is. I don't know how quickly they need to get their regulations through in order to be able to achieve their next product to market. And we need to make sure that whatever we're putting in place for these platforms is going to meet those needs because otherwise we're immediately shutting ourselves off from the customers of the environment that mm. we're trying to create. So I know that's a really obvious point, and I should probably have started by saying I think I'm probably the agitator on this panel. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, um, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll wear that badge with pride. Um, and I think the only other thing I'd say is that you know, good system engineers will always say that you know, risk-free approaches are in series, but pragmatic approaches are in parallel. Mm. And that isn't just the technical work, that's everything else that we're doing as well. And when we're thinking about how we're going to develop our commercial platforms, our use of LEO for R&D or for the manufacturing, which I think is the next step after this, then we need to be running that profiling of the regulations, of the liabilities assessment in parallel with all those different user needs and not in series. You say you're the agitator, but you are there talking to the customers who will be using these new platforms. And as you say, it's very important that we support these new users. So I'm going to turn to Tanya and ask, well, how does the international community change its approach to reliability to, to help all these new users to meet their needs? That, um, Hugely. <laughs> Hugely, <laughs> yeah, because what we have in, in space law is, is a state-based liability. Liability is, uh, is given to the launching state, which can be several states, but it is a state that has to present a claim against another state. And if we have this scenario where you have private stations, how do you deal then with uh, one astronaut causing damage to another on board a station or an accident happening in space? We heard several references to Gravity, uh, the movie yesterday, where you have astronauts from one station having to, uh, to, to go to another station. Are the docking mechanisms the same? Is it safe? Um, all those questions will have, to be, will have to be addressed, but mainly what we would need uh, to, uh, to devise is a system of uh, passenger liability when we have private astronauts going to uh, private, astro uh, private space stations. 
the current system in space law is only uh, third party liability, so causing damage to a non-contractual partner, but these will be persons who buy uh, a trip to space. And so um, the states will have to uh, ensure that there is an oversight, that there is uh, a licensing process, that there is perhaps uh, a liability for damage against third parties, but also the passengers themselves will have to uh, know what their liability exposure is. Also, what are uh, the rescue provisions? If there is indeed an accident, we have a rescue agreement where states are obliged to uh, rescue and the obligations are quite strict when human uh, passengers are involved. It's a bit different for uh, rescuing or returning objects that might crash in another country. But if you have astronauts in distress, uh, states are obliged to immediately render assistance and they cannot charge uh, for the cost of that. So what do you do if a private station is close to a stranded astronaut and can the government then oblige that the, the operator of that private station to go and rescue that astronaut? Uh, those are questions that will have to be addressed in the, um, in the legal framework. And so I see a, a large role here for the uh, supervising state uh, so the whole implementation question of Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty, which says states are responsible for the activities of their nationals in outer space, um, that will be the implementation of that in national law and in licensing uh, requirements will be, uh, will be quite important. Liability could, of course, also arise if the space station itself crashes. Um, uh, who would uh, then cover the damage? Can the state make sure that when it licenses a private space station that it has uh, a solid deorbiting mechanism, that there is compliance with debris mitigation rules, uh, and we come back again to making the link with the sustainability topic. Uh, so there also the, the risk is if you have a space station, uh, it's completely different from the small satellites that we have been discussing. If a small satellite is no longer working and uh, gets back through the atmosphere, it will burn up. So there's only really a risk of damage in outer space, which is subject to a fault liability has never been done, we have no case law, so there's no standard of fault. But if you have a space station crashing back to Earth, and we remember perhaps uh, those who are old enough in the room when uh, Mir was getting back in 2001, uh, I remember that Australia was pretty nervous because it's very hard to predict where exactly it's going to uh, enter. And of course, the majority of the Earth is, is water, so chances that it uh, falls into the Pacific or oceans is quite, uh, is quite large. But still, Still, um, the risk of something crashing on Earth might be much more real because we're talking about large structures here. And then we're talking about an absolute liability of the launching state. So that may bring considerable risk to uh, the state that is potentially going to be held liable. So we will really need to look at all these issues and I see a big role for uh, national law implementation of the treaty principles that are there, that we have to abide by. You, you bring in the, the human angle there, which of course is, is so important. And I'm going to move to, to thinking about this growing astronaut, the growing commercial astronaut call that we've got, and, and turn to Rebecca. Um, th there's been a question that, that's come in online, and, and please do keep sending them in. Um, the question I had for you, Rebecca, was, was does this growing commercial call require a different legal approach to ensure human safety? But it was an interesting point also raised online. With all these space stations that are coming, there might be as, as many as, as perhaps eight um, coming. Uh, do, someone's raised a question, is it time to have a multinational crew rescue um, situation? What are the, the legal um, things that we need to make sure that we can ensure human safety? Uh, one, one thing I want to raise with regards to liability is the liability structure that we use on the ISS today, which we are seeing more and more used in the private sector, which is a, a cross waiver of liability. And there's, there's a lot of great benefits to using this cross waiver of liability structure. It's basically where two parties agree not to sue each other under most circumstances with some exceptions, normally, uh, you know, with, um, with the exception of say willful misconduct. Um, but, it's not just that we don't, it's not just that we agree not to sue one another, we also agree not to sue each other's related entities down the whole chain. And this structure is very beneficial within space activities. Um, 
it basically says nobody's going to sue anyone. Mm -hmm. And it's also very beneficial because it, it allows parties to better understand their risks. And as you heard today, um, you know, what things can really drive down the cost of insurance as well. And I know in all of the um, private astronaut type missions, um, and not just our most recent private, not, private astronaut mission, but also spaceflight participants that have flown on Soyuz vehicles and in dealing with some of the insurance brokers, they want to better understand that risk before they write an insurance policy. And most insurance brokers get very comfortable or more comfortable with the idea when there are cross waivers in place. So I just wanted to raise that as a, a, possi a possibility for, for liability, liability regime actually on the station. Um, with regards to the, the growing commercial astronaut core, astronaut core on, um, on these platforms, again, I would go back to what do we know from our experiences on ISS? Um, I will say in the past, the past two years, I've learned a significant amount setting up the legal framework for the Axiom 1 mission up on the International Space Station. But I have to be honest, I, I didn't just learn from that mission. I've learned from the 20 years of experience of the spaceflight participants that flew up to ISS with the Russians as well. Um, we, we didn't set up the same structure that the Russians had put in place for their private astronauts. We, um, we did take a very close look at liability though and um, ensuring that our government astronauts were taken care of and we were bringing a crew not just of one private astronaut, but we brought a crew of four private astronauts up into space. And we did have to take, again, a look at that liability regime. Do we allow that private astronaut to come up and have that capability to sue the agency? Do we give that private astronaut the capability to sue other private astronauts? What type of insurance requirements do we require of the private astronaut? And not just the private astronaut, but also the company that was bringing up the private astronaut. Um, medical requirements, there is an interim directive that was put in place um, regarding the medical requirements of these private astronauts, and that's, that's publicly available. And that's great information for these, these new commercial platforms on, uh, on what they may want to implement for their platforms. We also, um, where I see a, a, a big difference too, we, we still are a government platform. So we do have certain requirements that these commercial platforms may not have in place, one being the crew code of conduct, which I mentioned earlier. But to get into a little more detail about that, there are some restrictions for our crew members within that crew code of conduct that doesn't allow them to do certain commercial activities because they are government employees. So how are you going to change that crew code of conduct? Are you going to have a crew code of conduct for these, um, for these commercial platforms? This, you know, what, what type of conduct are you going to expect from these crew members? And that does play very much into safety because you wanna understand what are the expectations of these crew members going up to, going up to station. The, the crew code of conduct also puts forth the command structure up on the International Space Station. Who's in charge? What, what type of authority does that commander have? Also something very important that we put in place for these private astronaut missions for purposes of safety is to ensure that there is a crew member that either has had previous space experience or experience in a harsh environment going up with these crew members to help them acclimate and ensure that they um, know their way around and help them figure out basically living and working in space. Do you have that requirement as well for these, these private, private platforms? Um, and, and the other thing I wanted to mention too, as, as Eric mentioned, um, NASA put out 400 and $416 million of seed money. Th these were done through funded, what we call funded Space Act agreements. But as a part of this process, it's not that we just hand over this money, as, as Eric mentioned. <laughs> We're not that generous. <laughs> um, 
but some the, requirements. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so these requirements, while I said earlier, we won't be, re I, I don't believe that we need to be setting up regulations through these requirements. We are still set, we are still implementing expectations on the commercial market. So as a part of, as part of these platforms, NASA is doing this because we want to get out of low Earth orbit. We want to be a customer of many in low Earth orbit. But as a part of that, our crew members are going to be on these commercial platforms. And we aren't going to just send our crew members to platforms without having expectations of um, um, specific safety certifications. And phase two of these funded Space Act agreements is that NASA will certify those platforms for use by NASA and partner astronauts. And many of these private astronauts that go up to these platforms, they're going to want to know, well, is that the same standard that NASA has? We did see that even with the private astronaut missions um, for, for astronauts going up to the International Space Station. They want it to be held by the same standards. They felt comfortable with being held to the same standards. So um, just my two cents worth. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating, two cents. I'm going to turn to some questions from, from the audience now because we are rapidly running out of time. Um, and it's an interesting question here that I think Lucy and Eric might have some, some thoughts on. Um, they say in, in 2021, the NASA, NASA Inspector General warned of the likely gap between the ISS retirement and the upcoming commercial space stations, which, in his words, could re result in a collapse of the commercial space economy, or the LEO commercial space economy. And what's your take on that assessment? I'll turn to Eric as the person who's going to replace it, and then Lucy, perhaps, as the, as the users of all of them. We don't want a gap. <sighs> OK. We'll mind the gap, if you will, as we're here. <laughs> um, no, we saw this movie before with, um, with transportation. Uh, to, to and from the space station where there was a long gap that the United States had of uh, providing you know, astronauts, U.S. astronauts, a, a ride to and from the space station. We were dependent on Russia, and, and that was not an enviable position that we were in. So we are extremely mindful of um, when NASA is projecting the, the station to um, be retired, and we are trying to plan well in advance to be open for business uh, well before that date. And we're shooting for um, 2027, uh, 2028 timeframe, which should you know, bake in some, some uh, leeway time you know, in, in between there. If you'll allow me just a, a moment of levity, um, it, it, Rebecca was saying mm -hmm. earlier on the, the comments about uh, the rules of the road, that how there would be no suing in space and everything. Um, years ago, in 2015, I, I was, our organization was working on this landmark piece of, of, of space legislation. It was, it was called the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act, and it was the biggest piece of legislation Congress was working on. And as many uh, from uh, the United States knows, Congress is not the most effective body of reasoning uh, from time to time and often don't get a lot done. But we were really moving the ball forward with the Democrats and Republicans, and the only group that held us up was the trial attorneys. Uh, that said, hey, we want the right to sue if something goes wrong. So, uh, so I always keep that in the back of my head. You know, maybe not international, you know, and space law, space attorneys, they're, they're a different breed. They're better than that. But, uh, <laughs> but, the, but the trial attorneys, beware. So uh, I'll turn it over to you, Lucy. I, I well, I think, uh, first of all, I'd say I, I don't think there will be a gap in the commercial use of LEO but I think it could look very different. I mean, the minister this morning talked about a company in Wales which is going from strength to strength called Space Forge. They're going to be looking at the commercial uses of Leo in a completely different way. Um, so I think we all need to be aware of that as well. And, you know, again, with my agitator badge on, I say, you know, these, these platforms are important. These, these livable spaces are an important part of the story, but they're not the only part of the story anymore. Um, there's a lot more that goes with it. And... Um, and so I don't believe there will be a sort of crisis of, of the commercialization of LEO. I, I think, you know, we have to be mindful of the things that can end up holding us back accidentally sometimes. And that isn't to belittle the regulations component, the legal component. But again, just to think about how, how do we actually want to address 
our user need. You know, risk shouldn't be set to zero. And we've got, we're probably talking about two sort of chunks of risk here. I mean, obviously there are thousands, but just to s simplify it, we've got that sort of healthy humans in space component, and then we've got the space debris component, which has been a big part of what we're talking about today. Now, there are aspects of going to space that affect the health of humans, but there are also aspects of climbing a mountain or sailing around the world um, in a yacht that affect the health of humans, or running a marathon, you know, it affects our health. So I think we've got to decide what is the risk profile that we want. And one human will want a different profile from another human because that's what we're like. So I think we have got to be thinking from the commercial perspective, there needs to be a minimum because we don't want people causing massive disruption in a place that's reasonably hard to get to. But also, let's think more carefully about what we really want that risk to be. I won't spend any time on the debris point because I think we've done a lot on that um, this conference and there isn't really a lot that, that's different here. Uh, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's the same debris challenge. Thank you very much, Lucy. I'm, I'm scrolling through the questions here to, to see how where best to take the uh, 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 conversation next. I'm, I'm going to um, pick up on this one and uh, turn to, to my two legal experts on the panel. Um, they, they say that uh, according to liability convention, states are responsible for the damages occurred in space in applications of the launching state principle or the object registration principle. I hope that's meaning something to you too. <laughs> um, how should we adapt this um, framework with the increasing um, participation of the private actors? And they mentioned SpaceX, but there are so many people coming in. We've touched on it briefly, but I wondered if you had any further thoughts. Well, yeah, I, I mean, we have the basic rules. Launching states are liable for damage. Uh, and, and there's a difference between responsibility and liability that maybe uh, is, is, well, that's sometimes complicated. Responsibility means that you have to ensure that the national activities of a state are carried out responsibly. That means that states have to carry out authorization and supervision, have to have a licensing system. Liability is linked to the launching state. So that's a different concept and it arises when damage occurs, when there is a problem that we have to solve by uh, providing compensation or restoring a situation that occurred, uh, that existed before. So liability is uh, linked to launching state and one of the launching states is the state of registry. So it's a bit a complex system, but I thought I would be, uh, it would be important to, uh, to highlight those differences. So that is all state-based rules. Uh, and as I said earlier, with private space stations, we have to really look back at that responsibility issue first, because states uh, whose national activities these are, and, and we do not have a clear definition, but likely where an operator is located, has its head offices, that government would be the, uh, the, the appropriate state, as it is stated in, in the Outer Space Treaty. That state has to really ensure that it covers its back because whatever the private operator is going to do may have consequences for, um, for uh, uh, states that, that uh, may mean that it has to compensate for damage if it is also a launching state. So that licensing system, that authorization and supervision is, uh, is as I said earlier, is going to be ever more important. And um, yeah, I think I would underline it that way. Thank you, Rebecca, any thoughts? Yeah, just I think maybe one thing to add is, as Tanya mentioned, the, the liability convention, when there are accidents in space, it's based on fault liability. Who's at fault? Um, and I think fault is very difficult to determine when you have no rules of the road. There are no um, uh, coordination guidelines of how actors have to respond in space. So a good example, if you have once if you have a space station that's going to possibly collide with a satellite, who's responsible for moving? And until you really understand that responsibility, it's very difficult to then determine who is at fault. So I think we do need better guidelines and a better understanding of what those rules of the road are to add more teeth to the liability convention that can be used in the future. 
And perhaps I can just add as an illustration, there was a recent case where China actually uh, sent uh, a note verbal to the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs saying that its space station had been endangered by a Starlink satellite that they had to carry out a, a maneuver to get out of the way. And so it was quite interesting because they used uh, Article 5 of the Outer Space Treaty, which says that states have to notify certain phenomena that they observe to the UN. And so they used that article to send uh, a message to the UN, uh, to which uh, the, the United States, uh, of course, as the responsible state for Starlink, uh, replied, but not under that same article, but under another article, Article 11, to give information to the United Nations, where it said, well, according to us, there was no danger, so we did not notify. So that really underlines also what Rebecca said, that need for rules of the road. We need to know what is the standard, what is too close. And apparently, in this specific case, the two states, it's a clear example where two states had a different understanding of what is too close and what has to be done and who has to move out of the way. So it's a very clear illustration that uh, space traffic management and rules of the road are essential to be agreed at a global level. Indeed, and I think that brings us really nicely into to where we have to sadly shortly bring this to a close because time is racing along. So I wanted to give all our panelist members just an opportunity to, to very briefly um, share any final thoughts. And, and the, the question, uh, if you had to pick one of the many things we've, we've been discussing in this panel, what space sustainability challenge will be most pressing in the changing LEO environment? Uh, so I, I think one of the things, that, and we talked about the gap and how do we avoid a gap, there, there's always the technical uh, aspect of you know, you know, projects pushing to the right, but you also have to look at it from a financial perspective as well. And um, you, know, you have to make a viable business uh, case and an inviting business case for others to join you. Um, otherwise, as we see with the financial markets right now and, and um, what, what a lot of companies are suffering, you know, maybe ha that have gone public too early and, and for not the right reasons and, and other uh, aspects of that. So I, I think that is, is, is something, but I think you also need for, as we're here talking about sustainability, you have to have the right business model to do the right thing. And, and that, you know, as we're talking more about sustainability, how do you, you know, involve more people, more aspects of um, thinking from a sustainable perspective from the beginning gets you there at the end. But if you want to just latch that on and, and just use it as a tagline one, once you launch, I, I, don't, I don't think you'll find a successful business model that way. All right. Thank you, Eric. Tanya, some brief thoughts? Yeah, let's look at, at creating prospects for future generation, which is also what sustainability is about, right? We have to make sure that the use of outer space is sustained for uh, future generations. So I would underline, again, uh, things like space traffic management in a very broad sense. So both what I mentioned earlier, the uh, in-orbit uh, maneuvering um, uh, rules, but also I think that is already applicable and important for the ISS, a big question, how do we deorbit these large structures and make sure that they do not cause damage and uh, even filling up the oceans with all of these stations is of course not an ideal solution for sustainability on earth either so i would see that as uh, the major challenges thank you tanya rebecca um, i think the the major point i would like to make as as an attorney that works with all of these programs the past two decades the one thing that i have seen that's really important is um, as i've listened the past day and a half and Everyone has, I think, absolutely wonderful ideas. However, what is implementable? And we always have to make sure that we are also looking at implementation and what we can implement and making sure the, the user is also talking to the lawyers and also talking to, to the people in industry. As Eric mentioned, also really important, you know, what's financially viable. If we over-regulate, we're not going to have a commercial market. Um, so, so where is that balance? And we do have to make sure that we are keeping that balance. Lucy. Yes, yeah, so I, um, I think a very quick technical answer is that in order to get the kind of maneuverability we need in LEO to do all the things we want to do, we need um, real improvement in our actuator technology. So that's a sort of side piece from, from a different part of my life. Um, but what I, what I would say in terms of the, the broader story is, is that um, you know, there was a huge precedent for operators 
working really closely together in space, privately, in the background, to solve really difficult problems, like when they've got two sets of state vectors that do not match, and who's going to move, whose fault is it, etc. Um, what I worry about is that space has just become more of a public conversation now, and those backroom solutions are going to be lived out in the newspapers or on social media, um, and that means that the diplomacy piece that was mentioned in the previous panel becomes so, so much more important. So I think linking the really good precedent that we already have for collaboration in space with some good diplomatic overlay is, is really where we need to go. Thank you. There is clearly lots to be done still, but lots of good groundwork to, to base it all on. And it's a really exciting time for the sector to be evolving. Um, and I hope we've given you some ideas about how we can take that forward and the work that we need to, needs to be done to enable um, this new commercial low Earth orbit space to be sustainable, to be safe, and to be accessible for many, many people, um, not just the space sector, but, but those beyond and, and profitable as well. So with that, uh, we have to close here. Um, I, I, can we please all thank the fabulous panelists. Thank you very much.